Louisiana's COVID-19 virtual town hall. Insight and answers regarding the opening of Louisiana's economy and your health concerns. Now, here are your hosts, Fred Childers and Harrison Golden. Good evening, I'm Fred Childers. And I'm Harrison Golden. Thank you so much for joining us here tonight for our Louisiana COVID-19 virtual town hall. Well, we hear just a few of the guests we'll be seeing tonight over the next hour. Coming up, Governor John Bell Edwards will join us. Then we will check in from Senator Bill Cassidy over on Capitol Hill. Also, we'll have former Louisiana Secretary of Health, Dr. Rebecca Gee, in the second half of this evening's town hall. We'll also be joined by several other Louisiana lawmakers representing every part of our state. We have the whole state mm -hmm. covered, Harrison. And a lot of messages to tell with that. Now, let's first go, though, to the latest COVID-19 numbers for the entire state. Tonight, the Louisiana Department of Health is reporting close to 3,100 confirmed cases and more than 2,000 deaths since the pandemic took hold here in Louisiana. That's right, and the LDH is also reporting more than 1,400 people are hospitalized with COVID-19 complications and close to 200 of those are on ventilators. And the first guest for our virtual town hall for COVID-19 is Governor John Bell Edwards. He joins us now from the Governor's Office of Homeland Security and Emergency Preparedness remotely. Governor, thank you so much for taking part in our town hall. Thank you, and I appreciate the opportunity to be with you and all your viewers. Yeah, so Governor, it's been almost two months to the date since you announced the first, as we called it then, presumptive positive COVID-19 case in Louisiana. That was uh, memorably during your state of the state address at that time. So, I mean, it feels like the world has changed so much since then, but right now, tonight, yeah. what is the state of our state? Well, obviously, like all the 50 states, but to a greater degree than many of them, uh, we're in the middle, midst of a public health emergency that, that our country hasn't experienced um, in over 100 years. Uh, we had one case, as you mentioned, on the day that the session opened two months ago. Uh, I think we're up to 30,652 cases as of today. And of that number, about 10,000 are active because the rest have recovered, and unfortunately more than 2,000 uh, have died. Uh, but that's only among those individuals who've actually tested positive. We know that somewhere around 20% and as high as 50% in some studies of, of all the people with COVID-19 are, are never uh, tested because they're asymptomatic, yet they are contagious. That's really what makes this particular disease so hard uh, to get control of. But having said that, Harrison, we are much better off today than we were just a few weeks ago when we had the, the steepest uh, growth rate anywhere in the country uh, and by many calculations anywhere in the world um, ahead of, for example, Spain uh, and Italy. So we're doing much better today. Uh, we still have a long way to go in this fight against COVID-19. Uh, and, and there's gonna be a new normal, unfortunately, until such time as there's a vaccine that's readily available for the population. Uh, but, but we're gonna continue to work with the White House, with the CDC, with our federal partners, and rely on medical science and doctors uh, in order to make decisions to maintain the proper balance between public health on the one hand and opening our economy on the other. Uh, and like everybody else, uh, I greatly look forward to the day, uh, to the day when more uh, of our economy can be open. And we're gonna do this in the phased approach that the president has set out uh, in his guidelines to reopening uh, the states. Uh, that's what we've committed ourselves to. We're gonna follow that uh, I do want to take a moment just to express my deep appreciation to the people of Louisiana because without their compliance, without their assistance, um, their patience, uh, we would not have been able to flatten that curve the way that we have. And, and while we have over 2,000 deaths and we grieve each and every one of them a tremendous loss, it would have been much more, many more deaths, many more cases uh, had the people not abided by the stay home order, uh, kept to the social distancing we've been recommending. Uh, washing hands and doing other hygiene uh, that we've been uh, asking people to do, uh, and, and then making sure now that we're wearing masks. So, so we're in a much better place than we were a few weeks ago, but obviously the world has changed greatly over the last two months here in Louisiana. And Governor, I'm glad you mentioned your uh, stay-at-home order. I, I wanted to talk a little bit about that. You know, in April, we issued the, uh, the, the stay-at-home order. It was set to expire in, uh, at the end of April, and then you extended it to May 15th. Um, 
I wanted to ask you about a comment from Representative Steve Scalise, a Republican who you've been working well with. He was tweeted um, by Sam Carlin of The Advocate saying, quote, Scalise also said Louisiana needs to open May 16th. We can't keep letting that date slide. What's your reaction to that? Well, first of all, uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that we can. Uh, we're going to follow the phased approach that the president put out. Uh, you were called just over a week ago. I spent uh, about 90 minutes with the president and the Oval Office. Uh, and he and the vice president and his team, Dr. Burks, Dr. Fauci, and others, well aware of what the situation is in Louisiana. Uh, and the, the basis upon my decision to extend the stay-at-home order uh, and supportive of that uh, ba based on the fact that we did not meet the criteria set out by the White House uh, for that phased reopening of our economy. Uh, we, we are going to uh, obviously reevaluate this with the most recent data. I do hope that this time that we will be able uh, to proceed to phase one. Uh, so in that, in that respect, I don't think there's much difference between myself uh, and Congressman Scalise. We both are eager to do this. I don't believe he's saying I should ignore uh, the president's criteria. I think it's an aspirational statement, much like I've been making, that I hope that we meet that criteria and that we can safely uh, move to uh, phase one, uh, open more of our businesses, get more people back to work, get more customers in stores and restaurants and so forth. All of that is critically important, uh, and we intend to do that with the phased approach that's been set forth uh, by the president. And the other reason why we feel better now than we did a couple of weeks ago is the additional testing capacity that we're bringing online every single day uh, and in conjunction with the contact tracing capacity that we're bringing online because we have to be able to keep a lid on the cases so that we don't spike and go right back to where we were. Uh, all of this is critically important if we're going to be successful. The last thing we want to do is have case, uh, cases spike uh, tremendously and then have to put the automobile in reverse, so to speak, and go back. That would actually be worse for the economy, worse for everyone, uh, which is why we're going to meet those, those criteria as we move forward. Um, but I, I agree with the congressman. We, we need to do this just as soon as we possibly can, but we're going to do it in accordance with the, the phased-in approach uh, that the president has set forth. All right, yes, and, uh, yes, and Governor, I want to get to a viewer question right now from Jason S., one of our viewers here uh, this evening, saying, or asking, will some social distancing measures be enforced while businesses are reopened when that day comes, Governor? Yeah, and, and look, pe people should understand this is not going to be a light switch where we just go back to the way things were three months ago. Um, this is going to be a new normal. It's going to be with us for a long time. Um, and you take a phased-in approach and you see how uh, the people respond, both in terms of how they abide by the restrictions that remain in place and what the cases do and the hospitalizations and the deaths. We have to monitor all of that. Uh, but under that phased-in approach, you don't, you don't go back to where you have unlimited occupancy at the restaurants and, and the different retail establishments and so forth. And so we're going to continue to ask people here and around the country um, to... to make sure that they are social distancing from people who are not in their households. When they're out in public, uh, that they wear a mask if they're going to be in close proximity to people who are not in their household, for example. Making sure that you're still doing all the hygiene practices, washing your hands vigorously for 20 seconds uh, very frequently, and, you know, as, as I mentioned before, wearing the mask. And then most importantly is for those people who are vulnerable, either because of their age, 65 or older, or because they have those chronic health conditions like hypertension, diabetes, heart disease, kidney disease, and so forth, they need to be especially cautious and vigilant. And by the way, people who live with them do as well, because you don't want to inadvertently bring the virus home uh, so that it can spread to the vulnerable population. So that's going to be with us for a while. Uh, we do ask people to be patient, understand that this is going to be a new normal, uh, and then as we, as we move through the phases, you're going to see less and less restrictions over time. Uh, but, but we're going to have some things that we're going to be asking people to do, such as social distancing, wearing the mask in order to keep the cases down until such time as there's a, an approved therapeutic treatment, which there's not yet, um, and until such time as there is a vaccine. We're hoping and praying that these things happen uh, sooner than later. Uh, but as you know, a lot of work has to happen. I'm optimistic because I know the best scientists and doctors in the world 
are working on this as we speak. Hey, Governor, we're just like you. We're running out of time, so in about 30 seconds, I know you're a big lessons guy. <laughs> what sort of lessons can we take away from this struggle that we're dealing with? Well, first of all, th that we need to continue to be good neighbors uh, to one another. And, and the nature of a pandemic such as this with the virus is that you have to not only worry about yourself, but worry about your neighbors because 20 to 50 percent of people with COVID are completely asymptomatic. They don't know that they have it, but yet they can be contagious. Uh, and so people wouldn't uh, even know that they have it. They can spread it. And that's why keeping distance from people who are not in your household, paying special attention to those who are vulnerable, uh, wearing your mask, all of this is critically important if we're going to be successful. And if we're unsuccessful, meaning if we can't keep the cases down, then the economy is going to be limited uh, under any circumstances, no matter what I do uh, or the president does or anybody else does. If we can't keep the cases down, people out of hospitals and so forth, then the economy is not going to come back the way we need it to because people aren't going to feel safe and comfortable. Uh, and so we all have a role to play, and I'm asking the people of Louisiana uh, to do their part. Everybody has a role to play, and, and just asking people to do their part, be patient, and certainly that we join together in prayer on this uh, National Day of Prayer, by the way, uh, for one another and for our state and for leaders uh, so that we can all do our part uh, to make sure that we get through this in the best possible shape. All right, good advice. Yes. Governor John Bell Edwards joining us tonight from his Office of Homeland Security and thank Emergency you. Preparedness. Governor, thank you for all the minutes you can offer. No, not many because you're a pretty busy guy tonight, but appreciate your time. <laughs> thank you. All right, throughout the hour, we'll break down coronavirus figures region by region, starting in the Baton Rouge area. Now, the Louisiana Department of Health is reporting more than 4,000 confirmed cases of COVID-19 in the area, over 300 deaths, and more than 24,000 tests have been completed by state and commercial labs. Joining us now is U.S. Senator Bill Cassidy via Zoom from Washington, D.C. Senator Cassidy, I want to thank you for coming on and taking part in our town hall, our virtual town hall. Thank you for having me. I'm glad to be virtual. <laughs> Well, good to see you. So you're the author of a bill designed to help keep state governments from going broke. State governments like ours here in Louisiana. First of all, tell me about that bill. What does it do? Yeah, it tries, it tries to protect essential government services that families and small businesses, employers, if you will, need in order to stay in business. So think about it. Um, uh, take a city, Baton Rouge, New Orleans, Lafayette, relies on sales tax. Uh, the federal government asked for sh economic shutdown. Everybody stops buying things. Sales tax receipts collapse. Hotel bed tax goes away. All these sources of revenue for state and local government, it's gone. Now, you still have to pay your police, your fire, your sanitation. At the airport, you still need a ground crew because if you don't have them, when those businesses reopen, no one will go. If there's no sanitation, who's going to eat at a restaurant with garbage and rats in front of it? So if we're going to recover our economy, we got to keep the whole ecosystem going and we got to recognize state and local tax receipts have been hit by this federal government ordered shutdown. So I want to get to a viewer question. Uh, this question comes from Linda D and she asks, will any more stimulus money be available to someone at risk that can't go back to work? Yeah, I think it's going to depend on how long this stretches. If this stretches for some time, I think there might be. I'm hoping that we begin to reopen the economy quickly. As we do so, it just kind of commerce begins once more. If we do have to send out another stimulus check, it's not really a good sign. People are glad to get the money, but it means that we're not on our road to recovery. It would be better if we were on our road to recovery. Right, and this next question what might have some people scratching their heads. This is why I wanted to uh, talk about it with you, and that is guns. You talk about wanting to protect Second Amendment rights, the right to keep and bear arms. Uh, you sent a letter recently to the FBI and the ATF um, talking to them about, you know, maybe the, the system, the background check system is a little strained these days during this pandemic. First of all, what impact has the coronavirus had on the national instant criminal background system? I, I, that is still working. What my concern was and the general concern is that some governors 
have taken this as an opportunity to kind of infringe upon Second Amendment rights, uh, passing restrictions on uh, on such purchase, uh, either ammunition or, or, or the gun. And um, why? It's like, tell me why? That just doesn't seem right. And so we just want to make sure the system's working as well as possible so there could not be an excuse to infringe upon Second Amendment rights. Have you gotten a response from the ATF or the FBI? Not yet. Okay. Not yet. So you've also advocated for immunity registries. So what, what would an immunity registry look like and, and what's it for? I believe you think it's important to reopen the economy. Yeah, I do. You know, there's, a, there's an article that came out tonight. I just saw it when I was home eating dinner. Uh, about that when people get rid of coronavirus, they're infected, they get rid of it, they form antibodies. Those antibodies protect them from being reinfected. Now, wouldn't it be great to know if you had actually been exposed? My assistant said he had a terrible flu back in February. He thinks he may have had coronavirus. If he was immune, he would not need to wear a mask. Now, let me emphasize, this is the first report, so it's not proven that the that that the antibodies make you immune but science is pointing in that direction i used to do this work when i taught medical students at lsu and so so if you're immune you don't need to wear a mask you can face the public if you're not immune you'll want to know that too because you're going to continue to wear your mask even when everybody else is kind of loosening up you're going to stay buttoned down so an individual knowing their immunity status is key to them protecting their health yeah, really good points, and I'm glad you brought up the mask. Um, you know, we, we go out into public a lot uh, doing what we do, and we see some people wearing masks and some people aren't. Uh, and we've also, at the same time, we've seen some of these, these restaurants, their restrictions are a little loosened up. Uh, here in Baton Rouge, we're seeing some of these, uh, these restaurants open up their, uh, their parking lot area. Um, how are you, especially with your medical background, I'm just curious to know, how are you with, with loosening these restrictions? Um, so um, there's, there's a lot in that question right there. So I went to a committee hearing today. There are six feet between me and the people on either side. According to the White House physician, we did not need to wear a mask. That social distancing was okay. But when I flew on an airplane, everybody on that airplane was wearing a mask, including me. That air is being recycled. It is a very small container. I wore the mask. Uh, now, by the way, uh, I could get exposed and I would do reasonably well, I think. I don't have risk factors beyond being over 60, but I can infect another person. So even if I do well, but I go and give somebody a kiss on the cheek, uh, uh, my, you know, if my mother was still alive, I'd go give her, give her a kiss on the cheek. She could catch it from me. So I'm concerned about that other person. Well, we know about your, uh, the, the latest bill uh, to help state governments. Are you working on any other legislation coming up that we should know about concerning COVID-19? Yeah, we're, we're thinking a lot about what we do. We actually are participating in the state trying to figure out. Again, my background is I taught LSU, I taught medical students at LSU, but I did lots of vaccination work, lots of public health work. So I'm talking to people doing public health initiatives around the state as to how can I help. So in the last week uh, or two, I've had a conversation with Dr. Burks, with Robert Redfield, who's the head of the CDC, and today in a committee hearing with Francis Collins, who's the head of the NIH. From each of those, got resources that could come to our state to help with this public health initiative. In fact, uh, Francis Collins um, uh, announced something today. How do you help areas with underserved population I said, well, tell me about that. He says, give me a call. I said, I got a lot of people that meet that criteria. So we're trying to bring these federal resources that will just help address the public health needs in Louisiana. All right. U.S. Senator Bill Cassidy, live from Washington. Thank you so much for taking part in our town hall. Appreciate it. Thank you. Now we're going to take you a little bit east of Baton Rouge right now to one of the hardest hit parts of Louisiana. Over in the New Orleans area, LDH is reporting tonight close to 17,000 cases of COVID-19 since this all began. More than 1,000 deaths and close to 80,000 tests have been completed there by state and commercial labs. And with that, we go to our station WGNO over in New Orleans and LeBron Joseph standing by with Representative Cedric Richmond. Congressman Richmond, welcome to our statewide town hall. I want to ask you, 
What does restarting the economy look like for you? Well, first of all, it has to be done safe. And in Louisiana, especially in New Orleans, we have, we'll only get one chance to do it right. Remember, all around the country, people were saying that New Orleans was the epicenter, the ground zero for COVID-19. And if we reopen, and for any reason, we have a spike, it may deter people from coming to Louisiana, uh, not for months to come, but for years to come, especially in New Orleans. So we need to make sure that when we open up, we open up according to what the scientists say, according to what this administration has laid out. Actually, one of the good plans they have is the one for reopening government if we follow it. And so uh, I think that we have to do that. The other thing is from a federal government standpoint, we need to uh, create a uh, stimulus for the reopening of the economy. And that, you know, if that means more money to local places for advertising to especially places like New Orleans, and we did it after BP all spill is to say, we're open, we're safe, come on down. And so we're just going to have to do it in a very smart manner. But I do want to caution this. When we open back up government, it will not be uh, when we back, open back up the economy, it will not just be a flat opening of the economy. It will be phased in. We will not, our new normal will not be um, a thousand people at church or 500 people at church. It will not be, uh, you know, Walmart with a thousand people in it. We will not get there immediately. So I don't want people to think that uh, it's a broad opening of government because one thing I think is you have to give people realistic expectations and that uh, this will not be a overnight opening of government. Congressman, the disparity uh, of health care for the poor in our state, and that is predominantly African American, been impacted by this, but also just poor people across Louisiana. What can you do from the federal side to be able to help that going forward now that the light's been shining on that? Well, a couple of things. One, we've asked, uh, we've requested that our Democratic caucus uh, and the House establish a task force on uh, the COVID disparity. But the truth is we've broadened it to just uh, a House task force on health disparities. And look, let's be honest. When you start talking about chronic diseases like diabetes, like high blood pressure, like all of those things that uh, influence African Americans more than others, you have to include economic disparity and poverty in that equation. And so when you start talking about chronic disease, yes, poverty and, and economic disparity should be considered uh, in that. Because let's just take this really quick back to the beginning. In the beginning, we said it was a concern. We said that people should watch out for this. Then we said, look, it's more serious than we thought. We're closing schools. But when we closed schools, we didn't offer any assistance or anything. We just closed schools. People still had to go to work. What do we do in our communities if we have to work and our kids are out of school? We bring them by their grandparents' house. That's the worst case for those kids or little petri dishes to be is by their grandparents' house who are most vulnerable with this uh, disease. Then second, people who need to go to work kept going to work and the overwhelming majority of uh, people who had percentage-wise who have to go to work every day uh, are African Americans and people of color. So they kept working and kept getting exposed then we said, if you're not essential, we suggest you stay home. So the more affluent were able to stay at home and thereby protect themselves, the less affluent had to continue to go out into society and go into work. They didn't have PPE equipment, masks were not available. So if you look at it from day one to the shutdown order, it was uh, unfortunately um, just a disaster for people of color, uh, black people, and uh, poor people. And so then we came out with assistance for people in terms of all these programs so that people could actually stay home and make ends meet. 
But it was not a great government response. It was a terrible government warning in the beginning. And so all of those things disproportionately impacted poor people and black people. So uh, we have to learn from it. But now we should double down on dealing with the health disparity, period. And that health disparity comes from food deserts, insurance, uh, health insurance deserts, banking deserts. I mean, if you could just go down the list of the things in the African-American uh, community that uh, continues to hold us back, and we have to make sure that uh, we once and for all address it. Congressman Richmond, thanks for your time today. Please be safe, sir. We're counting on you. Thank you. And now here's Urban League CEO and former mayor of New Orleans, Mark Morial, and what he thinks needs to happen before Louisiana can begin to reopen. The federal government's got to step in and assist the city, step in, assist the state, not just the city of New Orleans and the state of Louisiana, but all 50 states and cities across the nation. Because if the city can't afford its police force, its fire department, its sanitation workers, its public works department people who take care of streets, the people that cut the grass. You can't bring your economy back. All right, we have a lot more coming up. We'll be joined by former Louisiana Secretary of Health, Dr. Rebecca Gee, to get her insight on the coronavirus in Louisiana. And we'll also be hearing from two lawmakers from North Louisiana in three minutes. We'll be back. Louisiana's COVID-19 Virtual Town Hall. 
and welcome back to that COVID-19 virtual town hall. Our next guest tonight spent four years leading Louisiana's Department of Health, and she's now in charge of LSU Healthcare Services, which runs medical schools and medical centers across our state. Dr. Rebecca Gee joining us tonight. Thank you so much for your time, Dr. Gee. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. So I uh, want to get to first to a report last month from a network analysis firm called Graphica finds there's another kind of spread out there that of misinformation online regarding this virus. Uh, now, a senior official with the World Health Organization has called this not just a pandemic, but an infodemic. How concerned are you with that? Very concerned. Look, as this virus spread like wildfire across the globe, so too did misinformation. One study said that there were 46,000 inaccurate Twitter uh, feeds, posts, social media posts every day that would mislead the public. And look, the public's hungry for information. Not only is it a problem uh, because the virus is scary, but we're learning more and more every day and people need this information so that they can make it decisions about the risks that they're facing in their lives. Um, and COVID is a particular challenge because most of us aren't scientists. I mean, look, we're hearing every day about IgM, IgG antibodies, you know, what even even people who went to medical school like I did, I went 20 years ago, you know, you, you need to be reminded about what these are and, and educated about it. And, you know, when, when a study looked at people understanding what's coming out in the news, about 30% of us just don't understand. This was a Stanford study that came out last week. So it's really hard for the public to understand what's being told. And it's hard to fight the, the misinformation, but one thing you really need to do is look at the source, check it and make sure it's coming from the credible source. Of course, the governor has done a phenomenal job. His daily press briefings, the data that he's getting from the Office of Public Health, which I formerly ran, is fantastic. We have phenomenal leadership and very good data here in Louisiana that have been used. But you can also go to the World Health Organization and the Centers for Disease Control if you have questions and really want to make sure um, that you're getting good information because misinformation can be dangerous. And there, there are two areas where I think that's really happened. One was the early rumors that this was no worse than the flu. And of course, it's worse than the flu. It's much more deadly than the flu. When I was secretary, we had about 1,500 deaths from the flu. That was over an entire year in 2018. This virus within less than two months has killed over 2,000 people. Um, look, another piece of information was early on, African Americans were told that they weren't at risk for this virus. These, were, these rumors were circulated widely on social media. I spoke to Jerome Adams, our Surgeon General, and to Dr. Patrice Harris, who is the president of the AMA, the first African American female president, this week about this. And she said, look, even her own family was told this and was calling her saying, look, we don't think we're at risk because of the color of our skin, which is just not true. And so those things probably led to deaths as people went out into the community without protection, not understanding their risk. In fact, we know that African-Americans, as Congressman Richmond so eloquently described, are twice as likely to die from this virus. So our first line of defense in these epidemics is information. And unfortunately, uh, early on, the information has not been ideal. And as those uh, you know, gaps have come about, then it's been filled with misinformation. So please check your sources. It's really important because it could save your life. Of course, Dr. Gee, yes. And, uh, you know, we've been having viewers uh, not just witness to uh, those uh, daily briefings that the governor has been doing over the past few months, uh, but also watching our newscast here. So one question with that from Tanya A, one of our viewers, how do we move forward with reopening when it takes 70% of the population, in her words, to have antibodies for herd immunity to work? I mean, look, we, herd immunity is not going to be created until we have a, a large-scale vaccine, and that's at least a year away. Uh, Tony Fauci is optimistic that by December we might have it, and certainly many of us have, have you know, held on to every word. He's a very wise man, um, but we just don't know. So, look, herd immunity is far away, and so in the meantime, what, what do we do? Well, look, we know that this virus has killed more people in a single year as I mentioned earlier, than the flu, than diabetes. You know, we're in the midst of an opioid epidemic, more than drug overdoses last year. This is a deadly virus. We have to take it seriously. Um, we are fortunate to have strong leadership by the governor and by Mayor Cantrell here in New Orleans, who have been very clear in their communication to the public and nationally have been recognized for the excellent way that they have managed this crisis. And frankly, we were in big trouble initially. We were, uh, uh, in the first several weeks of this epidemic, had the highest growth, 86%, in the world. That was higher than New York City and higher than Italy. And the course could have looked very different. Look, at the end of March, there was one of our hospitals that was two ventilators away from running out. 
Hmm. So these these shortages were very real. The crisis was very real. But people listened and they stayed home, and it's made a difference. And I think Louisiana is a model example nationally of how to lead, how to communicate, and how to deal with the crisis. But look, the economy is suffering. People have lost their jobs. Domestic violence has gone up. Child abuse has gone up. A homelessness and um, you know stress, depression, all of that has gone up, and that has led uh, to an increase in deaths. Look, we have a 36% increase in deaths over what we would have thought the deaths would be last year. So big challenges, and we're going to have to manage this in a way that balances the health needs, um, because herd immunity is far away, with the needs of people to go back to work. And the decision is going to be made by policymakers like the governor. We've got to take politics out of this. We've got to listen to the scientists, as he has done with our scientists and doctors here at LSU. The last time he was going to make a decision about whether to reopen for phase one, he spent the whole weekend talking to public health experts, to doctors, to Dr. Bu at the Office of Public Health, who's done a masterful job, and, and many other leaders to ask them about the science. We've got to use science, but we've got to be reasonable and rational. We've got to balance that with the needs of people to work. And, and look, people who are vulnerable, people that have cancer, that have immune systems that don't work, people who are elderly and have chronic conditions or frail, they need to be informed of their risk and really think about it. Even if things reopen, what is their, gonna, their decision going to be and how do we support them? And look, we need to test, trace, and isolate. We've got to be able to test everyone. We're not going to feel fully safe until we know that we have enough tests. And I know the White House has said that he, they will send those tests to us, and LSU is helping to lead uh, the deployment of those tests. Um, to make sure that everyone who has symptoms or is exposed gets tested. But we also need to know who those people were around, make sure that we interview them. And then look, when you've been exposed or you're sick, you need a place to isolate. And if you don't, you know, if you're living with, as Congressman Richmond has said, look, you're, you're being cared for uh, in a family, your kids are being cared for by grandma, and you have to go home to a, a family where they're vulnerable people, that's not a good place to isolate. So how are we going to make up for that? How are we going to pay some... For, for you to be able to do that. Some have suggested, similar to jury duty, which I think is a good idea, that we pay you $50 a day so that you can be able to self-isolate. But we've got to think about this because look, what we're knowing now that we've always known, but we're reminded of is that the health of one person truly impacts the health of an entire population. Um, but you know, we've got an, another wave of deaths now. And those deaths are deaths of despair. Our, our clinicians who have cared for patients and look, our doctors, nurses, and clinicians in hospitals, they have never had a situation like we've had in the past several months where they've had to hold the hands, often with a glove, of someone dying with no family there, no one to, to, to say goodbye other than a telephone, of uh, you know, doing a, a FaceTime. So look, there's a lot of healing to do. People need to get back to work. They need to get back to normal. But those decisions need to be made um, because her, herd immunity is simply not going to be possible for a very long time. And life as we knew it before, it's going to be different, and we've all got to accept that. We're not going to go back to the old normal. We're going to have a new normal, and we're going to have to understand our risk in spending a lot of time doing a better job educating the public about how they understand their personal risk. Yeah, certainly you talk about a lot of those health needs, and we do have about a minute left here in this segment, but uh, again, those health needs across the state, not just for those with COVID-19, but those with other issues as well. So we've met many doctors over the past few months who worry the virus has been making uh, people hesitant to go to the doctors uh, to seek any sort of medical attention. Very quickly, in about uh, 30 seconds time, what's your message to yeah. those people? Yeah, look, LSU is not only worried about people not going to the doctor, we know they're not. Our data shows that, that presentations, people going to the ER for heart attacks and strokes have plummeted. And that means that people have died at home not getting the care they need. We had a patient last week whose colon, their, the digestive system perforated while they, because they had cancer that was not diagnosed because they were so afraid of getting um, going to a hospital and getting COVID, they refused to go. So look, please, if you're sick, go to the hospital. We, we have, we're doing a much better job now. We've got the personal protective gear. We know how to protect you. You've got to go to a doctor if you're sick. And our K-Health app for the month, for this month is free. If you go to LSU or K-Health, download it on the Apple Store, you can, you can talk to a doctor via chat. But that's good if you're not severely sick. If you're severely sick, please go to the ER. And we're seeing this all over the country, but in our hospital, a trauma center here, uh, over 30% reduction in people going. So please do take care of yourself. COVID is something to worry about. We've all got to be rational, but you've got, you know, if you're having chest pain, it's a headache, you've got to go and be seen. 
Yeah, certainly cannot get enough emphasis, Dr. Gee. Thank you so much again for your time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so great information there from the former head of the LDH. Now we're going to head north. We told you this was a statewide show. Let's get a look at the COVID-19 numbers in the northwest part of our state. Over in the Shreveport area, the State Department of Health is showing around 2,500 confirmed cases of the virus. More than 200 deaths have been reported in that area and just above 28,000 tests have been completed by state and local labs. So let's go over to Shreveport, our Shreveport affiliate, KTAL, where our friends Dan and Jackie Jovic are standing by with Representative Mike Johnson. Thanks, Fred. Here in Northwest Louisiana, as in the rest of the state and the country, we're wondering when we can all get back to work safely and begin enjoying some of the activities we enjoyed before the pandemic hit. Congressman Mike Johnson on President Trump's task force on reopening the economy. He joins us kindly now from his home in Benton. Congressman, thanks for being with us here today. Thanks so much for having me. Now, you've said we can protect lives and livelihoods at the same time. What do you think are the first steps to safely reopening the economy here in Louisiana? Well, I think the parish by parish approach is something that, that we've all talked about uh, at great length over the last uh, couple of weeks. We have to recognize first that not every area of the state is similarly situated when it comes to the pandemic. We've been harder hit in some areas than others. And so the recognition of that reality on the ground, I think, is an important part of that. I think local leaders are in the best position to make the decisions on what works for their jurisdiction. And so empowering them to do that and open up in the phases that the president's task force has recommended, I think is the way to go. I, I think that we need to do that in earnest because Louisiana's economy and our people are really hurting because of this. Well, Mike, let's talk about the three largest industries in the state of Louisiana, then oil, natural gas, and commercial fishing. All three of those major industries have really seen the demand for their product go away almost overnight. What needs to be the foundation of getting that demand back? Well, we do have the president's ear on both of those issues. As you know, he's, he's very well in tune with that. He, he took immediate action with Saudi Arabia and Russia who were manipulating the oil market, for example. And he's, he's talked about uh, taking uh, big measures. We've used the strategic uh, petroleum reserve. Uh, we're trying to put as, as much of domestic production and storage as we can so that we can take some of that, that glut off of the market. And as far as commercial fishing, we know that that's such an important key part of our economy around the state. It's something that I think does have the attention of the White House. In Congress, we have to be very aggressive in, in making sure that states that don't understand the dynamics of those industries uh, realize how really important it is to us. You know, Wallet Hub came out just several weeks back with an estimate of all 50 states and who would have the most difficulty recovering post-pandemic. Unfortunately, Louisiana was ranked first on the list as, as probably having the hardest time, and that was I, either even before we had the crisis in the oil and gas market. So we have a real challenge ahead of us. We know that we'll have all hands on deck and we need principal leadership going forward. I think even after the economy reopens, there are a lot of people who are going to be living quite differently. A lot of people are still will still be afraid. Let's talk about those phases of reopening and, and what that looks like for our state and for the country. Well, you know, in phase one, we get back uh, to some reasonable uh, resemblance of our economy, and that is in, in the workplace, for example, we would still uh, practice social distancing, we would still have sanitation protocols, but these are, these are not very difficult things to implement. We have to, I think, trust business owners to do that. Uh, even uh, the churches, I think, can begin to reopen if they, in, even in phase one of the, of the, the recommendations, uh, so long as they kind of change the way they, they do the, the gathering of large crowds. I, I, I've talked to a lot of clergy pastors around the state who are ready and anxious and willing to do that. I, I think, Jackie, we have to let people, uh, to, to give them a chance. I think that we've got to get people back to work. We have to get back to some sense of normalcy and returning to normalcy in the society, reopening the society, not just the economy, but every aspect of our lives, because that's really important long term for the, the maintenance of public health. Uh, I, I think that we're, people are ready to do that and we give them a chance and we can get through those three phases, I think, relatively quickly. Mike, it's a very complex issue. In fact, I talked with the GM of a local car dealership last week. He says he can't get many of his employees to come back to work because of what they are getting from the state in terms of unemployment and the federal stimulus checks. They're making more money staying at home compared to coming to work and not selling cars. How do we remedy that? 
Uh, Dan, that's a great point and something we've been trying to really trumpet here for the last uh, few weeks. There's a lot of confusion out there, I think, mm -hmm. amongst people that they can just stay at home and sit on the couch and decide not to go to work even when they're invited to do so and collect that, that increase in unemployment benefit, the extra $600 a week, which is a substantial increase over what you would normally collect in Louisiana. What we've been trying to make everyone very aware of is the fact that that is a commission of a crime. If you've been invited to come back to work and you're simply deciding not to do so so that you can take advantage of this extra benefit, you are violating federal and state law and you can be investigated and prosecuted. There are serious penalties to that. So we need that word to go out. There's uh, the LWC and the state is, is charged with administering those, those new federal dollars in that program. And, and they've been trying to echo that uh, concern as well. If someone is aware of fraud in that regard, aware of someone who's manipulating the system, and, and taking advantage of taxpayer dollars at a time of national crisis, it's unconscionable, and they need to be reported to the state. And Mike, you know the casinos are a large employer, big part of the economy here in Shreveport, Bossier, and down in Lake Charles. Those industries, driven by customer service, a lot of people are touching the slot machines and cards. So how can that industry survive in this climate when so many people are concerned about social distancing and, and personal hygiene and sanitation? That's, that's a great challenge, Jackie, and you've seen that casinos have been treated as one of the, the highest risk environments uh, in terms of reopening the economy because of the nature of their business and, and what you just described. So um, we, we have to allow the free market for innovation, for creativity to have a chance there as well. And I think a lot of the, the, the owners of those establishments, those, those businesses, I think they'll figure out a way to do it. I mean, again, it's not rocket science, but if you're going to if we're gonna practice, a, for example, a six foot buffer zone around each patron, it can be done. You may have to just use every fifth slot machine, I guess, or, or, or however that is. But we have, to, we have to give these businesses a chance to survive. And if we keep them closed down for an extended period of time, we eliminate their ability to do that. Ultimately, that drives more people into unemployment and ultimately poverty. And in my view, that's one of the greatest threats to public health is, is a broader um, uh, category of poverty for more people, and it's something we have to avoid. Well, it appears the country is taking baby steps. Louisiana will begin to do the same, hopefully, on May the 15th. Congressman Mike Johnson, kind enough to join us again from Benton, his home in Benton. Mike, thanks for your time. Thanks to both of you. Keep up the great work. Thank you. Now let's take a trip to north central Louisiana and the Monroe area. That's where LDH is reporting close to 1,500 confirmed coronavirus cases, just under 60 deaths, and more than 13,000 tests completed there since this pandemic began. And with that, we're going to take you to our Monroe affiliate KTVE, where Michelle e. Morton and Bodie Brooks are with U.S. Representative Ralph Abraham. Dr. Abraham, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, thank you very much. So a few questions to talk about, obviously an unprecedented moment happening in our time. And one of the first things that we want to look at is obviously we're on that path to recovery. The administration has said that we can protect both lives and livelihood at the same time. And what are the first steps in reopening Louisiana, specifically Northeast Louisiana? We're seeing some cases, certainly in Northeast Louisiana and Washtenaw Parish seems to be one of the uh, hotspots that we're seeing now. The rest of Northeast Louisiana, more in the rural parishes, certainly have their cases, but not nearly as bad as the New Orleans and the uh, New Yorks of the world. So to get back to what we hope is a normal business climate, then we start reopening these businesses slowly with people understanding that there still has to be some distancing, there still has to be some uh, masking, those types of things that do help prevent the spread of the virus. But we also know that this is a very widespread airborne virus that is well dispersed and uh, more likely than not, eventually you're gonna get exposed to it one way or the other. And that's where antibody testing comes in. Congressman, as you said, Northeast Louisiana is very rural. State leaders have said that the key to reopening the state is more testing. However, a lot of these rural parishes are reporting very little testing, some less than 100, as opposed to Washtenaw Parish, where we have tested thousands of people now. How do we expand testing in these rural areas, and can we currently rely on the case numbers we're seeing coming out of these parishes? 
Well, I think you can rely somewhat on the case numbers. Again, you, the people that are going to get sick, there's enough fear out there that if you have fever, cough, sore throat, the big medical attention. The question is, is how many people have been exposed, have developed the antibodies already to the COVID virus and never knew they were infected? I truly believe personally that that number is going to be in the 30 to 40 percentile range. Now, Dr. Abraham, you have the benefit of both being a lawmaker, an elected official, and being a medical doctor, and in a rural area as well. Now, lots of residents are having a hard time following those mitigation efforts. And as a doctor, I want to ask you if you've seen an impact in your own practice. I mean, you have your white coat on right now. What's it looking like where you're working? Well, we are seeing, you know, some sick people of a variety of ailments. Uh, the thing that we have to remember that People still get sick from certainly other things other than the coronavirus, the diabetes, the hypertension, the cardiovascular diseases. Those things must be addressed because simply if they're not, then those people get sicker and sicker and sicker. So in this clinic that I'm working with right now, we're seeing a little bit of both. We're certainly seeing those people that come in with the sinusitis, the fever, the cough. But at the same time, people are starting to come in for their routine checkups because they know if they don't, they could easily end up in the hospital. Congressman, right now, Washtenaw Parish is reporting almost 800 cases of COVID-19. Now, just weeks ago, we were seeing numbers like that in Shreveport, and their cases now are doubled from that. How concerned should we be about Washtenaw reaching cases like Shreveport or even New Orleans? Well, you have to be concerned. And again, that goes back to the, the previous question of testing. The more we test, certainly the more people that we're going to find that are either mildly symptomatic or completely asymptomatic. But the, but the difference will be how many people we can get to test. I go back to the antibody test. One, it, once it's widely available and it's coming soon, then I think we're going to be pleasantly surprised at how many people are immune to this COVID. Now, Dr. Abraham, kind of shifting the, the conversation a little bit, looking ahead to our landscape in Louisiana, our economic landscape in Louisiana, we went from having the lowest unemployment numbers in the history to the highest since the Great Depression. Here in Louisiana, a lot of people are filing unemployment at numbers that we've never seen before. Once the state reopens, once the economy reopens, how do we continue our, our build towards that success that we once saw pre-pandemic times? Well, we've got to get back to work uh, in, in every aspect, even us in the House. So, you know, we're not going to Congress right now. The Senate's in session. We need to be in session in the House. But unfortunately, the, uh, the Speaker is not allowing that to happen. As far as those that are having the jobs that they need to go to, that the jobs need them to be at, you do the smart things, you do the common sense things. And again, as Americans, we are smart enough to know how to protect ourselves and as important, how to protect our families and our coworkers against exposure. So you do the things that we have been told to do over and over, and that is some social distancing, some masking, those types of things. And if we do that, and if we get back to work at the same time, I truly believe those things can cohabitate well together. Now, if I'm someone who has lost my job, I'm now unemployed, how confident should I be that my former place of business uh, may have gotten a PPP loan? And if so, should I be considering you know, them possibly rehiring me or should I start looking for a new job? And if so, when? Well, Eventually, well, I'm gonna have to go back to work. We hope they rehire. That, that's our fear on the congressional level is that because of the economic problem and almost the bankruptcy that it has caused some businesses, that businesses may not be able to rehire long term. The PPE loan or the money is available for only eight weeks. And we understand once that runs out, those businesses have to be viable enough to support a payroll. So we are very concerned about that on the uh, national level. Only time will tell, but uh, again, we need to get back to work very quickly here. 
Dr. Abraham, I want to circle back to something you said in the pre, not this last question, but the one before, uh, with regard to, you know, clearly residents are smart enough. We know how to take care of ourselves. We know how to keep ourselves safe. But I have to ask this question, even here in Washtenaw Parish, other parishes we see a flattening of that curve. Here we see continued and an increase in case numbers. So how do we, how do we equate for that? How do we explain that? Well, just an increased testing, I think. Uh, again, you know, so there are pockets of people that have not uh, abided very well by the rules and the advice that has been given. You know, how do you correct that? I don't know if you can. Uh, that goes back to uh, the people themselves trying or wanting or needing to do the right thing. But again, as more we test, the more we're going to find positive. Now, just because they're positive doesn't mean that they're hospitalized. It doesn't mean that they're on the ventilators. Uh, most, if uh, you know, probably 99% plus of the cases that are symptomatic can be treated outpatient, and they do very well. So the numbers are worrisome for sure. I think they will continue to go up as we increase testing, but at the same time, uh, most of those patients that uh, are symptomatic can be treated very uh, easily and very uh, adequately in a home setting. Well, Dr. Abraham, I want to thank you so much for taking the time out thank of your you. very busy schedule. Again, out there serving the people in the hospital working, and we just appreciate you taking that time to stop and talk thank with you. us. Thank you very much. All right. Back to you guys. All right, there you have it. You've heard from our governor. You've heard from state health leaders. You've also heard from congressmen from all over our state, and they've had some really great information to share. They talked about the, not only the danger of COVID-19, but the danger of having a damaged economy. Their mm -hmm. overall message, Harrison, mm -hmm. we have a challenge ahead of us, but if we stick together, we can pull it off. That's it. And again, this is a state that has seen its share of troubling times. But again, we're going to get through this all. And we'd like to thank our next door stations across Louisiana for coordinating all of this and speaking to some of the leaders who know this best. All right. Thank you for joining us for our Louisiana COVID-19 virtual town hall special. Have a good night. Good night.